All right, let's talk about some algebraic reasoning questions to prep for the TSI. So first thing to remember is the algebraic reasoning section is the largest section in that first 20 questions of the TSI. There are seven questions over this section, so it's really important that you focus on a lot of these. The good news is a lot of these questions can be solved by plugging in different answer choices. So let's look at this first one that we have here. So it says, in the xy plane above, so we have a picture of a graph, point C has coordinates 6, 9. Which of the following is an equation of the line that contains points O and C? So we have the point C, which it tells us is at 6, 9. And we have this point O. And notice that point O is where the x and the y axis intersect. That's always going to be the origin, which is 0, 0. So if we want to know which of the following is an equation for the line, the first thing to remember is that Algebra 1 equation that hopefully is stuck in your memory at this point, y equals mx plus b, where m is the slope and b is the y-intercept. So first thing you can do is look at this picture of a graph that they give you and look at the y-axis, because part of our equation is having the y-intercept. Well, if you follow this y-axis down until you get to where your line intersects it, the only point at which this line touches the y-axis is at the origin, which has a y-value of 0. So we need an equation that has plus 0 at the end. If you notice, though, none of our answer choices include a plus 0 because we typically don't write plus 0 at all. We typically leave it off. But if we were going to have plus or minus anything, it would be 0. So it can't be A or B because they have minus 3 and plus 3. Those would be lines that intersect the y-axis at positive 3 or way down here somewhere at negative 3. Since we don't have either of those things on our line, neither of those choices can be the correct answer. So we've eliminated some. The second option is to try and figure out the slope, which you can of course do with your slope formula. So just a reminder, y2 minus y1 over x2 minus x1 or rise over run, and you could do that with both of these numbers, these pairs of points. But an easier way to do this might actually be to just take these two numbers and plug them into each of these answer choices and figure out which one makes the equations true. Remember in a point, x is the first coordinate and y is the second coordinate? Well, we could just take both of these and plug them into our equation and see if it works out. So for this first equation, instead of y, we would say 9 equals 2 over 3. And then instead of x, we have 6. And any time you plug in a number, you should plug it in in parentheses. Okay? If you simplify this, 2 over 3 times 6 is going to give you 4. 9 isn't equal to 4, so it can't be c. The only thing we're left with is d, but it's always good to verify that your answer that you have left actually works. So if I plug in 9 for y, I get 9 equals... 3 over 2 times, instead of x, I can plug in 6. 3 over 2 times 6 is, in fact, 9. So 9 equals 9 is a true statement. So we have our answer to that question. Okay, but if this, was, this last part was confusing to you, you can always come back to the beginning and use your slope formula, and you would still end up with 3 over 2 for your slope. So it would still have to be d. Okay. Um, let's look at another algebra question that people tend to find kind of confusing, and that's something involving exponent rules. So on number 9, we have 3x squared, y to the third, and then in parentheses, all of that to the power of 3. There's a lot of exponent rules. They can be really hard to remember. But if you can remember to distribute whenever you see parentheses, you still do that even when you have powers. It's just in this case, you're distributing a power to another power instead of a number to another coefficient. So everything that's in the parentheses, no matter where it's located in the parentheses, is going to get a power of 3. So this 3 will distribute to the 3 that's at the beginning. And we're going to end up with 3 to the power of 3. This 3 that was at the beginning doesn't have a power written. That's an understood power of 1. So when you distribute the little 3, you end up with a power of 3. Next, we distribute it to x squared. So when we distribute 3, the power of 3 to x squared, we end up with x to the power of 6. We multiply the powers together. And then last, we have y to the power of 3. If we distribute a power to 3 of 
3 to that, we end up with y to the power of 9. So 3 to the power of 3, x to the power of 6, y to the power of 9. Now when I'm solving these questions, I tend to pause after each step and see if I can get rid of any answer choices. So looking at this first answer, I notice it has x to the power of 5. We're supposed to have x to the power of 6, so it can't be that one. Uh, maybe b it has x to the 6th, y to the 9th. C has x to the 5th, okay, that one can't be it. And then D has x to the 6th, y to the 9th. So now I have it narrowed down to B and D. And looking at B and D, the only difference between those two answers are the coefficients at the front. B has 9 at the front, D has 27 at the front. Well, if I look up here at what I have, my expression starts with 3 to the power of 3. So it's important here for you to remember what powers represent. Powers represent repeated multiplication. So 3 to the power of 3 means we need to multiply by 3, and we need to have that 3 different times. So 1, 3, 2, 3s, 3, 3s. So 3 times 3 would give us 9, times another 3 would give us 27. So our answer here would be D. Okay? Um, the last thing I want to look at is a question like number 10 where you're asked to solve an equation for a value. So for example, this one says if the square root of five minus x equals four, then x equals, and then we're meant to fill in the blank from there with one of the answer choices. So trying to remember the rules for solving an equation, especially when it becomes more complicated, if there's something like a square root or a fraction or parentheses, it can be kind of challenging because you have to be really careful with the order that you do things in. But because this is a multiple choice test, a lot of times it'll will, it will actually be easier to start by plugging in each answer choice until you find one that works. And you can try and plug in ones that you think might work, or you can just start from the top and go down from there. So in this one, we have square root of five minus X equals four. So I'm gonna start by plugging in the first answer choice. So I'm gonna write square root of five minus, but instead of X, I'm gonna plug in negative 21. And you'll notice as I do this, no matter what, when I plug in a number, I always put it in parentheses. The reason that I do that is a lot of times in an equation, there's some kind of implied multiplication or order that something's supposed to be done in. And if you don't put the parentheses there, it can mess you up on that order. So just general rule, when you plug something into an equation, stick it in parentheses. So I plug in the minus 21, and then at the end I still have equals four. Now I wanna verify if this is true. So order of operations, you start with parentheses. Well, I have negative 21 in parentheses. That doesn't really do anything, but I notice I have something in front of my parentheses. So I have minus and then my parentheses. So I'm gonna go ahead and bring that minus in. I'm going to distribute it the same way I would distribute a negative one. Anytime you have minus minus, that becomes a positive. So this is positive 21. So five plus 21 is under the square root. And then all of that equals four. Now a square root works kind of like a parenthesis because it groups everything underneath it together. So the next thing to simplify would be the part underneath the square root symbol. Five plus 21 is 26. So we want to know, is the square root of 26 4? Um, no, it's not. The square root of 26 is some kind of weird decimal that we don't need to know right now. So it can't be A. A is not the correct answer. So I'm going to erase all of this. I'm going to leave this part there because I'm doing the same thing every single time, though. All right, now I'm going to try plugging in negative 11. So square root of 5 minus, plug in negative 11. Now we're going to do the same steps to see if it equals 4. So if you have minus a negative, you can change that into plus. So inside my square root, I have 5 plus 11. We're checking to see if that equals 4. Then we can simplify whatever is under the square root. 5 plus 11 is 16. We want to know, is the square root of 16 4? Yes, the square root of 16 is 4 because 4 times 4 is 16. So that gave us a true statement, which means our answer has to be B. So that's a good strategy if you don't remember all of your rules for simplifying and solving complex equations. Plug in each answer, see which one works out. And that's what you're going to do for the majority of the questions 
on the algebraic reasoning section of your TSI test.